A4 of Tabletop Squadron Con 2020. Um, we're not at Gen Con edition. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining us. <laughs> and um, we have an exciting panel to start the day. It's Aquatic Gaming Under the Sea with Whitney, Megan, Richard, and Taylor. Uh, all right, y'all need to plug your stuff, introduce yourself, and then we'll have Richard take it away with the first topics. Go right ahead, guys. Okay, uh, so I'll start out uh, since I'm sort of going to be hosting the panel. Um, I'm Richard Kreutz Landry. Uh, I am one of three designers uh, working on Descent into Midnight, uh, which is surprise, surprise, an aquatic RPG. <laughs> um, and uh, joining me today here uh, is one of the other designers. So Taylor, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what you do besides the Sentinel Midnight, because there's a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, hello, friends. My name is Taylor. I use he and pronouns, and I'm on Twitter at Leviathan Files. Um, you can also check out the over 30 small RPGs that I've published on itch.io at riverhousegames.itch.io. Um, uh, if we're looking at aquatic games, you can check out uh, This is a Game About Fishing, which is a game about queer fisher folks in a, a post-capitalist uh, apocalypse. Um, or You Are a Very Tiny Fish with a Big-Ass Laser Sword, which is my playbook for Troika Jam that I did, uh, and that's very, very fun. Um, yeah, you can check out uh, the podcast that I do, Game Closet, where I talk to uh, all sorts of really amazing queer and LGBT plus folks in the tabletop RPG scene. And I think that's where I'm going to cut it for plugs. You can find all the other things that I do on my Twitter. <laughs> all right. Uh, Whitney, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, hi, you I'm Whitney. My brand is LilithProductive.com, uh, which is where you can find information on my aquatic role-playing game, Prism. Um, you can also find me at Twitter at, at Little Dragon, And that is my plug. All right. Uh, Megan, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Megan. I uh, mostly do podcasts. So uh, my husband and I started the Redacted Files podcast, which plays a lot of investigative horror and then sort of drifted off into playing anything we thought looked like fun. Um, so it's a variety uh, actual play show. Uh, but branching off of that, we started the Amber Clay, which is a Numenera actual play podcast, the first season of which takes place primarily under the sea um, and I, I don't have a lot of formal trading in anything about under the sea it's mostly things that I see that look cool and then incorporate into my games and I think that actually takes us right into uh, the first question right <laughs> so um, that question is what is it that drew you into uh, aquatic setting. So let's let's start uh, with you, Megan, for the Amber Clave. What was it that spoke to you um, about that setting? Um... Um, I always really loved the sea. That was where we always went on vacation. I grew up in Utah, and we would go to the Oregon coast every summer. Um, and so that was always like a special place for me, and we'd splash around in the tidal pools and poke sea anemones. Uh, and starfish and pick up sand dollars and so like I've always loved the sea and it's just like you feel semi-safe like standing on the coast uh we did almost get pulled in by an undertow <laughs> last time I was um walking on the beach <laughs> oh, but dear. we did not <laughs> get sucked out <laughs> to sea um, but it's like, it's the danger that's behind it too. The sea isn't mm -hmm. a safe place. It's not a place we understand. Um, like if you go deep into the sea, we don't really know what's there. And it's, it's an unexplored like mystery. And mm -hmm. what I love about Numenera is that you can fill in the blanks with whatever you want in the game. Um, it's a very science fantasy sort of setting. And mm -hmm. so it's a great place for my imagination to go wild. And the ocean just has so many cool, un-understood things about it. Um, and Numenera does have a supplement called Into the Deep, uh, which is uh, a bunch of underwater stuff that has a bunch of rules for underwater 
combat and stuff that I mostly ignored. <laughs> but, um, Fair. They have a lot of cool, like, their own ideas, and then it's so easy to expand on that with things that I stole from all sorts of other media. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and how about you, Whitney? What is it that sort of spoke to you about aquatic settings as a place to, like, set your game? Um, well, as a little Whitney, I was really into nature documentaries, and um, one of my the uh, first video game experiences on the Sega was Echo the Dolphin. Oh yeah! And I'm like, this is so <laughs> cool, and so infuriating at the same time. Yay! Mm -hmm. And like, growing up, my favorite uh, Disney movie was The Little Mermaid. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, whenever I played a role playing game, I always wanted to play a, a aquatic character. Like when I played my first role playing game was Besom big guy, small mouth, and I played like a humanoid leopard seal. I just kept nice. it going until I got to Pathfinder and I was like, oh, there's a mermaid uh, race. I didn't know mm -hmm. that. I'm like, yeah, we're going to be on land though. So sorry. I'm like, but, but, but mermaids. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I, it was basically a Bender, Blackjack and Hookers moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Um, I decided to make my own game about, um, about aquatic stuff. And there's just like something about like underwater I love so much because like um, I remember I'm playing um, 3D aquatic games like the deeper I go and the darker the water gets the more horrified I feel but it's, it's kind of mm -hmm. amazing because you don't get that experience on land. Yeah. Um, um, so I wanted to create a game that had a bunch of underwater elements but like hand wave all the like the complicated or obnoxious stuff like fresh water versus salt water and mm -hmm. and not and breathing and stuff like that and make it more like okay picture this sharks but humanoid and sexy i mean <laughs> and, why not right yeah, so that's, that's just basically what i rolled with <laughs> fantastic uh and and taylor uh i believe is our our fisherman extraordinaire here uh <laughs> resident like minnesota druid right like yeah. basically so so tell tell everyone a little bit about what speaks to you about aquatic settings because i mean yeah yeah clearly they do to you <laughs> right um yeah no i'm like the i'm like the freshwater gay the the, the of the group here um <laughs> in that like um, I, I don't have like I don't have very strong attachments to like the ocean, mm -hmm. um, but I do like I, I grew up in Minnesota, land of fourteen thousand lakes. Ten thousand is just better for marketing, um, <laughs> and uh, it, it's just always kind of been something that's been a huge part of my life. Um, mm -hmm. My earliest memories are fishing uh, with my dad, with my my mom's family up in northern Minnesota. Um, I. I did one year of college away from Minnesota. My first year of college was at University of Iowa, or no, Iowa State University. Um, and it was just so unsettling to live in a place where I couldn't walk or bike to uh, a lake or a river. Like it was just mm -hmm. land for forever. Um, mm -hmm. And it was something that was just like, it, it was uncanny in my heart and soul. I was like, this is not where I'm supposed to be. Um, it, and, and, like just growing up around that and in that kind of like that culture of of lakes and rivers and always being around like the the spots to fish and like always having an opportunity to connect with the life that lives in freshwater like being able to pull a pike out of the water just like on a weekend mm -hmm. or something <laughs> or like going to fish fries in the neighborhood or um you know like uh, rafting down the apple river or mm -hmm. rock climbing in the saint croix um kind of just always being around that source of of water and life was something mm -hmm. that is just like extremely extremely uh affirming and like part of of who i am and how i was brought up so mm -hmm. that is my connection to the water <laughs> um, well yeah. and, and i feel like i feel like seeing a lot of your games like it you can tell right that there's that connection there um mm -hmm. and it came out in your writing for descent into midnight obviously mm -hmm. um so i mean for myself uh what drew me to it like uh bad twitter joke um <laughs> yeah. to be honest uh you know it was a it was a joke about a mermaid uh a mermaid playbook for monster hearts because i wanted to make the pun bro side in um 
and all and that that's that's how yeah, yeah. that's how <laughs> that's how the conversation got started for that actually led to descent in the midnight um with uh me and rich and taylor um but like uh you know i'm i'm from san diego right so i'm i'm 20 minutes from the ocean uh, my grandmother actually when i was growing up um my my mom was like hey you need to hang out with your grandmother because she's not going to be around forever. And so, you know, they made sure that like I hung out with her all the time and everything. And she got me yearly passes to either the San Diego zoo, which is fantastic. or And so like, I just, I grew up with kind of like marine mammals and all that, like, you know, the, the charismatic uh, fauna of the ocean being like a thing that I enjoyed. And then I got a, a Nintendo and I played the Ninja Turtles game and I got to the water world in that. And I, th- I think that might have been the turning point of just like, screw everything underwater. This is awful and terrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then I came back around to it, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I, I think, you know, like you all have said, there's, there's something um, very like mysterious and like full of life about the ocean that that, that kind of speaks to me um so i think one of the things that rich and taylor and i talked about a little bit um when we were thinking about descent in the midnight and how to present it um is the idea of this is a setting right the, the an aquatic setting that people for some reason often seem to go oh well it's it's tough to run a game in or it's tough to create a setting because there are all these things you have to worry about um like pressure and light and breathing and and for some reason it's like my game is about magical fairy people who hang out with dragons but the idea that breathing underwater could just be a thing is like oh no um so uh so let, let's start with Whitney so um what are the ways that um like you approach those challenges of like how how getting people past that um in your game to just be like no no, no don't worry about it or or how do you interact with those those challenges for people running things in a setting maybe they're not used to Right. Um, well the first thing I thought of going back to Echo the Dolphin is that it's kind of like maybe like oxygen hit points um, and then there was a um, version of Little Mermaid I um, uh, read where um, humans would just have a, a air bubble that they could breathe through. But I was like, all it takes is for one like mean player to pop it and then everything goes downhill. So, eh. um, <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, then I just settled with um, everyone in the games being amphibious. So it doesn't matter. It's like they can breathe on land, they can breathe on water, it, it, and and then just and um and they can just move on because since it's such a like um more social and less combat game, I want people to be like um, uh, worrying about you know, breathing and if they're they, they equalize their nose or not or not. Right. So um that's basically what I settled on as far as as um air is concerned and since it's like a fantasy game it's i'm not going to worry about okay well if i'm a cactus am i going to like get waterlogged underwater it's like it's not something you worry about it's just that right since they're all humanoids it's like all like the 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 bio- biology can just get like hand waved and it's more about like the the um what makes it cool about like so you can focus more like oh i'm a cactus and uh and, and the moonstone cactus are my favorite succulents or, the, or I'm a, a I am a, a, I have a cuttlefish quality, so I'm bioluminescent, but I'm not colorblind. Like the cuttlefish ones, like I actually see my colors, which is great. So mm-hmm. it's it's like um, that's basically what I would do. So as you can just, it's um, kind of like going back to what you said about taking elements you like and putting it in, and just like mm-hmm. ignoring the things that make it less of a enjoyable experience. But it gives you but opportunities to like think about like how um, you would do things underwater. Like for instance, there's one session where people were like, okay. We don't have telephones, obviously, so we're going to leave people, leave people with messages in a bottle for each other, and that's going to be like our, our mailing system. And there are some people who like um, in SpongeBob, where they would like whisper into a bubble, and the bubble would travel and then pop, and that would be the message. So you think of all kinds <laughs> of fun ways to like take it to deal with like problems of being underwater. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so Megan, I know you mentioned uh, 
that you know some of the rules for games especially ones that are established and that can be a little crunchy i numenera is not a crunchy game right yeah. um yeah. but it does have um enough there to interact with if you really want to um but it's also a system that lets you kind of like hand wave those things if you don't want to because the core system is simple enough. Um, so what are some of the elements that that you found helpful from the source materials and like you you interacted with and went, oh yes, I'm definitely going to use these. And what are some of the things that you kind of set aside? Um, so I think one thing, sort of going back to something you were saying earlier where uh, in D&D you it's scary to go underwater. And I think part of the problem with that is D&D has the set rules for breathing underwater. Like you can cast mm -hmm. a spell to be able to do that. And then it feels unfair to the people who have taken time to take that spell that all of a sudden now everyone can just do it. And so like, I feel like some of those things like it's unfair or it doesn't make sense or fit into my game. It makes it hard for people to to want to hand wave those things mm -hmm. um, and those things exist in Numenera too um, so Numenera has things called ciphers which are sort of one use magical items that can uh, do something so there's ciphers that give you uh, kind of like Whitney was saying like a bubble of air around your head mm -hmm. or a suit that lets you go somewhere that's pressurized um, or you can get mutations that give you gills um, and then you're just fine underwater. And so there's, there's lots of different options to bring in uh, your character being able to survive underwater. Um, you could go with using the ciphers or you could go with using uh, longer lasting ciphers which are called artifacts or you can get mutations or you can get special abilities. So there are lots of different options to sort of pull in to let your characters be able to move around underwater and uh, survive that mm -hmm. aren't like limiting you to, I have to be a nano, which is the magic user, that mm -hmm. to be able to breathe, um, which is really helpful. And the, the Into the Deep provides a lot of things, like it provides recommendations for a combat underwater, like it's mm -hmm. harder to move um, people using uh, weapons that aren't optimized for using underwater um, it's harder for them to attack mm -hmm. and I mostly ignored those rules because <laughs> um, there's enough like adding and subtracting of bonuses that keeping track of those as well was just complicated so I just mm -hmm. I think what you have to do is decide what's important to you um, and what's making your story interesting and just keep mm -hmm. those things and not worry about the other stuff because there'd be times in combat that I realize oh we're underwater this doesn't quite make sense but mm -hmm. As long as we're all having fun and the story is making sense within the world, it's fine. Mm -hmm. It's okay that um, someone was firing an arrow. Um, it just somehow magically ignored it, ignored the extra resistance of the water or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, you just have to be okay with keeping what you like and getting rid of what you don't like. And that's what we all do with any game anyway. Like. Mm -hmm. I've never sat down and played a game and followed 100% of the rules. Even if you're like playing Monopoly, you're not doing that. You're mm -hmm. um, breaking rules, adding your own home rules. And so it's okay to do that in your RPG as well, as long as everyone is on board with it. Yeah, I know before we actually started uh, and went live, uh, we were talking actually about how SpongeBob is almost like a and cartoons are actually an interesting way that are that are set underwater are actually a really interesting way to think about like how to do game design for underwater settings because it's like in spongebob the fact that they're underwater doesn't matter about 80 percent of the time and it's like the it's you bring it in when it makes sense to enhance the story that they're telling right mm -hmm. um but uh but yeah so so taylor um obviously you've done a lot of um i think less crunchy uh game design um where so some some inside baseball that we've talked about for three years because we've been designing and promoting this game for three years uh uh is rich and i came from very sort of like crunchy like that that is where our heads and our hearts are with role-playing games or at least they were until we started this design process um like 
what what do you think doing like having a more story oriented focus allows you to do um with underwater settings and are there things that you miss or feel like you're losing out on or is a trade-off to crunch your systems with an underwater setting yeah that's a good question um and i i'll also say like i also came up playing crunchy games like i played dungeons mm -hmm. and dragons until like a few years ago <laughs> like that i feel like you, you might have just been ahead um, of the curve a little but <laughs> in front of me in rich though <laughs> yeah maybe, i don't know um but yeah no i i think it's it's to kind of bring all of what everyone has been saying into a into a like a synthesis or maybe like a, a central thesis like mm -hmm. it's about defining the culture of play that you want to set and if okay. your culture of play is like hey i want to have a tactical story where we are like where we're trying to uh to do um we're trying to like tell a story of like a struggle with like an adventuring party or like mm -hmm. show how they're overcoming odds. Then it's like, yeah, we can do crunchy stuff. Like you can do rules for combat or like resistance underwater. Um, and I think what some of the, the less crunchier games are the more like rules light or story focused games are like, I, I'm really big into lyric games right now. Like a lot of that is not about like setting rules because the, the idea there is like, if you have, if you set a rule for something it means that anyone who doesn't have access to that rule can't do that thing. So right. if you're like, hey, here is a skill for, you know, underwater fighting. Mm -hmm. If you take that, you can be like, yeah, I'm really good at underwater fighting. That's awesome. But anyone who doesn't take that is then, you know, left out of the lurch. Mm -hmm. um, but if you just say, like, instead of focusing on rules, um, you can focus on, uh, like, prompts mm -hmm. to um, explore what is interesting or what people, what catches people, what hooks people, we're using a fishing metaphor, what hooks people instead <laughs> of like what people are using to hook, like mm -hmm. that I think is, is maybe uh, a more fruitful way of playing in an underwater setting because then that allows people to bring themselves in and say, you know, not, hey, I have this feat that lets me do X, Y, Z underwater. Mm -hmm. It's them saying, hey, here's this cool thing about the ocean. What if I X, Y, Z? Mm -hmm. if that makes sense at all <laughs> yeah yeah um i think i think we've seen that in in the like in, in the games that we've run um speaking of which um i know from personal experience um just designing and running um games that are set in aquatic settings you tend to just it, it's like the the here's a fact right um i think it's on average an american sees either a cow or a picture of a cow once a day hmm. now that you now that i have said that you will probably notice over the next couple of days when you see a picture of a cow and go huh um or if you don't um so as someone who's designing games in this space and thinking about that you start to like notice all these like cool ocean facts and if you follow marine biologists mm. on twitter etc etc cetera, et cetera. um but while we're running these games and, and like you were saying when when people are coming up with these cool facts um what's something that y'all have learned um or been surprised by running a game like this that like someone else brought to the table and you're like oh um because because that happened a lot when we were first running set in the midnight um or or if you don't have a specific experience like that, what's a cool fact that you would like to share with everyone else about something aquatic? Uh, so Whitney, go ahead. What's uh, <laughs> tell us about something cool from the ocean? Um, uh, there was a session at Big Bad Con where um, uh, the the group of players were celebrating a baby shower with a bro mom and dad. And after mm. the baby shower was over, they had they went on like a, a camping trip and um, sub, submarine volcano forest. I'm like, I, that's another reason why I made an underwater game. It's just an excuse to have submarine volcanoes. <laughs> 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 and um, 
uh, in the game, some people can turn into like merfolk and some people turn into like small versions of their animals. So there was like a cuttlefish. Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, we're gonna build a slide and do like, like these like really sweet stunts because we're bros. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was like, she's like, okay, I'm gonna turn into a little tiny cuttlefish and like go sliding down the slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, and oh. um, a, an interesting fact I learned while um, making the game is mm. um, I was like um, trying to find excuses for um, shark back rides. It's like horses on the floor and a thing. Mm -hmm. And um, since it's a game about like sensuality and intimacy, um, I um, tend to make a lot of like like um, 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 sex content and sex jokes. Mm -hmm. And so I was like amazed to find out <laughs> That um, uh, uh, male sharks have two queens, <laughs> or yeah, yeah, called claspers. I'm like this is the best set of knowledge I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> Back to the big bad uh, con, um, because mm -hmm. the um, uh, the mom is a, is a is a shark, but uh, and um, her husband got her a uh, male um, sexual organ strap on <laughs> as as. <laughs> <laughs> and and it would be too because yes and it would be too yeah. so. <laughs> fantastic yeah. um there's actually i don't know if you all saw but there, there was a thread going around um just on twitter like last week i i want to say of someone who was just like listen y'all animals do it weird and like they were <laughs> going through and it was like i was i was not expecting you know i'm like scrolling twitter before i go to bed like, all right it's time to go to bed then i'm like what in the world all right so i started reading it like an hour later i'm just like i learned so much the, the animal kingdom is so weird <laughs> and fantastic um i'll have to link that at some point if we if we have a way to do that but um but yeah uh so megan what's um what's something that you have seen brought to the table uh that's like a real ocean fact or like a cool aquatic thing that you weren't expecting um the one thing that I am big on as a GM is making my players do the world building work for me. Um, so a lot of times we'll get to a place and I'll be like, what's out there? What are you seeing? What's cool here? Um, and one of my players, Landon, came up with this entire like food chain for these um, uh, lobsters we ended up calling them <laughs> and so there's like the entire food chain there's like needle fish that are being eaten by this that are being eaten by the lobsters and there's like the whole circle of life mm -hmm. and like later on um they're like trying to uh start farming this because there's like certain properties from eating the different steps um for for the players mm -hmm. and so we're in a, our third season right now um mm -hmm. playing and we switched completely different characters but the clobsters are still coming up as something that like these new group of players are interacting with um mm -hmm. and so the like i said about the ocean we don't really understand it and so anything can be out there um especially if you're playing in a fantasy game like you just anything you want to imagine can probably be there mm -hmm. um and I don't know, I don't have a cool ocean fact other than maybe like the one thing that's really fascinating to me is plankton. Um, just how much of our world is dependent on these like itty bitty uh, mm -hmm. one cell mm -hmm. organisms and how like it's mind boggling to me, like how much oxygen they're producing and how much they're doing for our environment. And we barely even know they're there yeah. um, in our day to day life. So I love plankton. I also love octopuses as you can probably tell mm -hmm. but um plankton <laughs> is something that's also really interesting to me that um isn't talked about quite as much as octopuses <laughs> yeah and, and there's it's it's definitely interesting seeing which which animals become the charismatic face of like you know like various things like oh okay you know everybody knows you know uh shamu and and flipper and and all these Keiko. things and, you know <laughs> mammals yeah exactly um and and then there's you know the soccer predicting octopus and all these things <laughs> um but it's like i i went to um oh gosh it was a it was a holiday thing at the local aquarium in la jolla and it was called seas greetings <laughs> mm-hmm so I had to go because it was awful yeah. and funny. Um, 
and uh, uh, they actually had a dino flagellate display where you could go in and they had this like, you know, uh, like a conference room, right? Because they do talks and everything in education, but they had a tent set up to block the light. And then they had these little containers and you just like, dink, 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 and it, and it would light up. And it's these, you know, these tiny organisms um, that light up as a way to attract the predators of their predators so that the predators <laughs> of the predators will eat the predators <laughs> when the predators disturb the water. And you're just like, I, I appreciate that level of fuck you <laughs> to, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I'm with that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so uh, we we do see y'all in the chat there. Um, and Demon Nicodemus was saying, hello, I would like a heartwarming relationship story about sharks learning more about their sexuality. Uh, fun fact, you can do that in pretty much any of the, the three games. You can have like cool shark people. You can uh, definitely like Numenera, you can do whatever you want. Um, and like, Dim, you would just, you would just have to make your shark psychic too, <laughs> right? Um, amazing. Uh, and then, Taylor, I know you are a font of cool ocean information. So tell us a little bit about like your your favorite fact, or actually, no, give give us tell us about your favorite freshwater fish because I want to know this. I I know you've told me before, but I'm I'm drawing a blank now. Yeah, so my favorite freshwater fish is the walleye. It's uh, it's a fish in like the northern states, um, and I guess everywhere else. But um, mm -hmm. it's like iconic to Minnesota. Like you'll get walleye everywhere. They're in um, Lake Malax is actually um, one of the better places to fish for walleye. But because it is such a like a a fish to go after and such a like a mm -hmm. cultural touchstone it's becoming endangered so you can't oh, like commercially fish for walleye uh i think in canada there are places where it's like you just don't get it mm -hmm. um and farming for it is tough uh i i don't know i just i i like it i don't have like a bunch of facts about it but um the well, thing so I let do... me let me ask you this let me ask you this yeah if you had to play a walleye in a game what would its personality be like um, it'd be like really skittish, uh, because they are, um, they're super skittish. They're like really cautious with anything. Um, they, uh, uh, he would also be like one of those people who was like always on coffee or like <laughs> some sort of stimulant and just like, mm -hmm. just kind of like wild and, um, and, and, um, like, uh, yeah, skittish. I don't know. My brain mm -hmm. is out of words. It's Sunday. Um, <laughs> they're fair, walleye, fair. But, yeah. They're called walleyes because they have a membrane in the back of their eye that reflects light like a cat when you like point it at it. Oh, okay. Um, and so they have these like big eyes that just like shine at you. So um, they're not like deep like an angler fish, which you know you we think about like fish with like big eyes and like mm -hmm. whatever shining lights, but they're still so cool and they've got these pointy teeth uh, and like mm -hmm. huge uh, spines on their back and their fins. Um, and uh, I I don't know I just love them. <laughs> um <laughs> the um the fact that i did want to share though was uh mm -hmm. about wetlands uh because wetlands are actually um uh, a more effective carbon sink than forests um because biological bacteria or biological mm -hmm. material is broken down by bacteria in an anaerobic state which means without oxygen so um it's just like a place to just stick carbon um, mm -hmm. And they absorb 25, I, I think, like the fact is 20 time, 25 times their weight in water. Um, and it's so like any wetland that just has peat moss is just mm -hmm. like a big, squishy swamp of like horrible stuff rotting. But it's, it's way more better for, uh, for getting rid of carbon in the environment mm -hmm. than like literally almost anything in the entire world. Uh, mm -hmm. But we don't hear about it all that often. And like uh, efforts to, um, you know, they're impacted in the same way that forests are in terms mm -hmm. of like deforestation or like wildlife destruction uh, in terms of like industry and capital. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's a, a big push right now to save wetlands and, and conserve 
uh, because of these things. And so I, I wanted to both share this fact to say like, here's this really cool thing about wetlands, but also mm. to put people, um, to like get it in, in front of people. There's a study mm. on climate change that's happening in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, which is where my grandparents live, uh, where they have put essentially a bubble over a spot of wetlands for like decades huh. to study the effect of greenhouse, like the greenhouse effect. Mm -hmm. So there's this giant plastic bubble that's over a, a huge part of the wetlands and they're seeing like, they're seeing massive acceleration of, of like climate change and like the ecology changing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's very, very frightening to see uh, what is happening to the wetlands in that spot because, mm -hmm. um, because we know that they are so such a, a crucial part of, of combating uh, our, our carbon emissions. So mm -hmm. that's very scary. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that, that to me is more terrifying than like the deep unknown of the ocean is, mm -hmm. is the fragility of the ocean systems or like the fragility of aquatic ecosystems. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we, we hear that 1.5 C factoid, like if the ocean raises by one and a half degrees Celsius, boom, um, like devastation. And, mm -hmm. and that to me is, is so scary. Um, mm -hmm way more than like hey there's this big thing in the water that's going to eat me so. right well and and i feel like you know descent into midnight definitely has that be a a thing that you can address because you're you're creating essentially the end the the corruption right that you're dealing with mm -hmm. for it um so i guess two things um like first do so i i know i've had this experience of of again like when you're following people who are interested in the ocean and all that there it is almost a double-edged sword with the the like the more knowledge you gain about these science facts you're the more you're like wow this is things are not great at the moment you know mm -hmm. um uh but i i wonder like for from a game design standpoint um like when you're dealing with an aquatic setting do you feel like that's something you want to take on in like a, a, as a as a story point like like Whitney mm -hmm. or, or Megan have you sort of dealt with those before as things that that you engage with or is it more kind of like keeping it to things that are uh like smaller scale and things that are like <laughs> is that one of the things that you go mm, let's just we're well, good like <laughs> my players did um set off or create a vape volcano in the middle of the ocean so there, there's like massive changes mm. happening there mm -hmm. um which which we're dealing with a bit more in the new season but i think uh i wanted to make a recommendation based on this idea of having climate change uh, affect your story. It's a book called Into the Drowning Deep by Myra Grant. Oh my God, that book is so good. Killer mermaids and why they're reappearing has to do with climate change things and how mm. um, you could tie in things that are happening on the surface of the world and things that are um, um, changing what we're dealing with in our lives and also how it affects the sea and why like now the sea is hungry and is uh, sending killer mermaids to kill people which is amazing mm -hmm. um and it's a really good book um and definitely a place that i i steal ideas from <laughs> yeah um and and whitney do you feel like that's something that you're kind of is that not the story you're telling or is that something that you engage with um in in certain games or some games or um that is not really a subject matter that's really come up because when i was making prism and since um, after deciding to make it less crunchy and more um, of a social game mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to be standing on too many soap boxes so i'm already talking yep. about like pluck gender norms i'm already talking about right. like every you know total you know sex, uh, queer spectrum so it's, mm -hmm. like, I, it's like adding like uh you know uh um a pollution and climate warm mm -hmm. and, 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 and climate and stuff like that would be like like a little too much it would take away from what is already in the game 
mm-hmm. because it's supposed to be like a, a game where it's like two humanoid leopard seal and there's be like hey how you doing not like mm-hmm. oh my gosh there's so much plastic on the shoreline <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> it's yeah, totally yeah. ruining our date <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well i i think that that kind of dovetails nicely into you know we're we're talking about aquatic settings and games and all that um and as a as a general thing how how do you approach writing games as far as like um like okay i'm gonna write a game i'm gonna set it in an aquatic setting um like what is your sort of guiding principle to like keeping you on task and keeping a game focused on what you want um i i think whitney that might be a question for like how what was how did you know kind of like did you know exactly what the game was going to be when you started or did it kind of evolve into okay (laughs) fell to the no because going in my only i i I, I wasn't really into indie games quite yet Mm -hmm. so my only experience was like a, a 3.5 of D&D where it's, mm-hmm. it's like you know rolling initiative and seven different dice and a mm-hmm. bunch of crunch and spells and stuff so um prism at first was like a d10 system and very crunchy more about mm-hmm. like uh, like um, combat than anything else mm-hmm. and as i got into the indie gaming community started playing like part by the apocalypse games and lady blackbird and stuff like that um i slowly decided like um to make it more of a game that I wanted to play, whether instead of a game I, that I've played before. So it's like, okay, I, I like rolling dice in some games, not others, so I'm gonna get rid of dice. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. I want this to be, I, I really like, you know, you know, you know, hot and heavy LARPs where it's like super, like a more like social combat than physical combat. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna make it, you know, uh, uh, more social. It's like, okay, I want this to be a game about different relationships, like senpai, won't you notice me? Or, you know, frenemies. So mm-hmm. I'm gonna make it, you know, relationship mechanics. Mm-hmm. And I, um, and um, at first it wasn't as aquatic as it um, was now either. Okay. It's more like a, um, it was more focused on the polytheism aspect. Mm-hmm. So um, now that it, it's, um, so it definitely has evolved um, mm-hmm. since I started working on it. Um, and to, um, fast forwarding to the end result where it's a, mm-hmm. a um, aquatic, uh, Dice is an aquatic role play game about relationships and conflict resolution. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it was definitely really fun to like read it and go, it feels like, like you could, you could tell there was like just a hint of like, there was some crunch that was like in there that has like been shifted around and like massaged into into this really cool diceless system. Um, and like again, as somebody where we when we were writing Set in the Midnight, one of the um, the things that we were doing is we were originally going to have uh, species types. So you could be like, oh well, I am a, a an aquatic mammal, and so I might have a power like echolocation. Or I am a cephalopod, so I am squishy. And I have color-changing skin. And all this, and then Taylor came in and was like, "Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Why are we doing this?" And we're like, <sighs> "I don't know. Dolphins who are squishy and can get through small spaces and boneless and have like weird tentacle arms and can change the color of their skin and be sparkly and are psychic is fucking rad." Yeah. yeah why are we stopping that from happening <laughs> so, right. I was um, like, a it's gonna be a lot of work to write up all these rules mm-hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> and b yeah. yeah why don't we just let the players do it yeah <laughs> oh. i think uh there's pressure being a game designer and to build a game that's good at everything but you're not gonna mm-hmm. build a good game that's good at everything like yeah. If I want to play a really good game about like confronting darkness, then I'm going to look for something like Descent into Midnight. Like I'm not going to that for like a different experience and finding mm. the game that's giving you the experience that you want is is something uh, that I think is super valuable and something that uh, playing all the different game systems we have on the redacted files is really clarified for me mm-hmm. because like there's, there's things I want to do in a game and some game systems just aren't good for that. And so you have to, when you're building a game system, be like, this is what I want this game to be good at. And this is the experience I want people to have. And it's okay if in my social game, people, there aren't as many rules for combat and combat isn't really a thing because the focus of this game 
is people talking together and interacting, not uh, who is going to win in a mecha bot fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I, I know Rich will, will talk about this, um, but um, Jeff Barber, who, uh, you know, was, was a big part of um, writing uh, Blue Planet, I, I, I think they're the co-author, I can't remember now, but um, we actually got to hang out and, and meet Jeff uh, at Gen Con last year, I think, and the year before. Um, but it's a, the, the original version of it was very, like, crunchy aquatic setting that that like took a lot of those um those sensibilities of you know like a you know a 90s um simulationist kind of game with lots of crunch and applied it to a sci-fi aquatic setting and it did that really well because there's so much cool stuff that you can do if you go you know like uh if you're doing sci-fi in an aquatic setting, like there's there's all these different animals, you can deal with the things like the 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 pressure and the depth and the the you know downtime for mammals and all these things if you want to. And with sci-fi, you have some extra tools to be able to do things like you know um, have translators for um, for marine mammals and things like that. Um, and it's it's such a cool thing to be able to see the the different approaches to the the same kinds of settings right you know because it's like underwater it's like that that's that can be a lot of things right it can be uh, a horror game you could do something where it's like you're just going down into the depths and you don't know what's going to happen right it can be something fun like hey we're we're cool like half mermaid people hanging out on a beach like right um and I, I think seeing the way that, you know, as, as game designers approach what they want out of the game, like seeing how they get to that is really fun. Um, and like, uh, Taylor, I know this is a game about fishing. I, I love, I love looking back to see how it's changed over time. Um, mm -hmm. And like, you, I would love to have you talk a little bit about that. I know it's not like, it's not specifically like, hey, we're fish hanging around underwater, but it does have kind of that that cool aesthetic of like, yeah, that love and appreciation for the water, like you were saying. Um, yeah. So how so um, how was how was that process for you, kind of figuring out what that became? Yeah, and I think it it has a couple parallels to like other parts of my both my personal life, but then also my like game mm -hmm. design journey. Uh, and so as I've radicalized in both my personal politics, but also in my like game design um, like aesthetics or ideals, it's mm -hmm. changed. So it, when it first started uh, like four years ago, five years ago, um, I like had dice pools and I was trying to do skills. And then for a while, it was a Powered by the Apocalypse game. And now it's like weirdly inspired by belonging outside belonging, but I would like mm. didn't actually care or try to like make it a hack of it. I was just like, okay, right. well, whatever. Um, but then uh, as, I, as I've kind of grown as a game designer, learning ways to mechanically express my political views has been mm. really important. Um, and uh, I'm gonna go back to Descent into Midnight and then also mm. connect to Prism um, because one thing that Whitney does in Prism really well is saying these characters aren't human. Like you don't have to be like words like boy or girl or gay or straight like mean like literally only what you want them to mean. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like reading Prism in there was like w was really empowering to me to say like okay we you can just fucking do this <laughs> and like it rules. <laughs> um, and and like going into descent into mid like if, you, if you're playing something that is like not human like why why are we having human I ideas um mm -hmm. about like gender or sex outside of the fact that they are personally important to the players playing the characters and so mm -hmm. you can create these sort of like anthropomorphized um uh like idea stories like it's not a plot story it's an idea story like what is what does gender mean to uh, jellyfish, like what is what does all of these things mean? And then you can like explore and interrogate those things as people playing those mm -hmm. and, and saying like, what are the stories that we are telling about gender, sexuality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so 
finding ways to incorporate the the patterns that I'm seeing in stories that build off of that is something mm -hmm. that I'm really excited to like inject into both Descent into Midnight, but also this mm -hmm. is a game about fishing. Cool. All right, we are actually about 10 minutes away from the end. Um, so I am looking at chat now. So if you've got, if you're watching and you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to lob them into chat uh, and we'll talk about them. Um, I have the, a question actually, if oh. I could steal that, because I was okay. hoping to make that tee up into getting Whitney to talk about Prism a little bit more. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> So, yeah, and I don't necessarily know that I have like a good way to question that, but like I, I want to know more about your your experience designing that at, at least that part of Prism. Oh, um, well, a lot of it came from me actually playing um, LARPs, um, uh, like My Jam, uh, Nightingales, and um, Lumberjills, for example, because I was like, I'm really into like hard on your sleeve kind of games where it's like, here are my emotions. Here's what my character's feeling. And even like mm -hmm. with like games with like, and like I even like, you know, twist murder hobo into like passionate murder. Like, okay, I'm a faith, I'm a faceless in apocalypse world. And my boyfriend was just a captured. I'm gonna murder everybody in my path until I get to <laughs> back to my boo. So mm -hmm. it's like, um, and like in, in the um, indie um, gaming communities when I found out I was queer. So it's like, I wanna make a game where this, where, where, where like um, gender and, and your, um, um, your sexuality and your uh, profession and it's like more like uh, 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 frowned upon in regular society like sex working is like it's like not a issue because that's not what I want prism to be about it's like oh man those two women are married Puh. it's like oh thanks for inviting me to the wedding I'm so excited we're gonna be shot it's gonna be great <laughs> Um, so I, so, um, telling if, if I want to tell a story where it's like hard on your sleeve and hear my feelings, and I love you so much and head boops, it, it can't be about, you know, gender issues and sexuality issues, um, in, 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 in a negative light anyway, mm -hmm. um, because that takes away from like the, you know, the feel good aspects. And of course there's a lot of um, times where prison was kind of, you know, sad or, or, or scary, but it was more like, a, um, of course there was like, you know, um, player consent when it came to that. Like there was a time where um, it was a one-on-one -on -one session and um, the player's um, uh, partner was actually um, a ghost, but she didn't realize that, but the ghost was hanging on because it's like, I wasn't sure if you were ready. Um, so I was uh, ready for me to you know leave you yet. So now that I know you are, I'm going to you know, move on to the afterlife. And it was like, you know, really, really pretty scene. And, you know, um, uh, and, you know, and um, experiences like that would be ruined if it was all about, you know, yucky, stupid, you know, stuff that's going on right outside about subject matters like, like that. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. I went into ramble mode. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that, that, that's great. And I, and I think it, it, it speaks to, you know, it, kind of circling back, it, it, it really is kind of like picking the story that you want to tell and adjusting the, the game to say, what is important to the story and what is not, what do we not, really want to deal with um and uh, again i think we, we've we've talked about it already but like you know people have weird hang-ups you know and and for some reason aquatic settings seem to bring that out in a way that mm -hmm. others don't like it's think you know it's like how many games are there where you get to play in a spaceship or you're in space and nobody bats an eye right it's like yeah okay whatever cool we got spaceships but you say underwater and people are like, oh, but, but what about, what about this? And what about that? And you're like. I also think it's because there's so many video games where the water level is a piece of shit or hard as fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's, right? Thank you. Like, like um, if you say Eckhart Ocarina of Time, I'm like, I hit the water temple. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and honestly, like, I think there, there really is some truth to that because it's like the, in, in video game design, right, you, you got to vary things and you go, oh, okay, well, this is the level where you do this and these are the challenges. And it's like, oh, this is the water level. So this is the one where you're slow and awkward and you have to do the thing where it's the moon lander thing where you're like, you're constantly sinking, but you got to, <laughs> it's like, oh. Um, speaking of which though, um, if, if we're talking about aquatic video games, I uh, have to give a huge shout out to Abzu 
which is like this oh it's so good um it, it's a relatively short game it's a couple of hours but you're playing as like this this being with little flippers and you're just going around and you're swimming around you're hanging out with fish and you're having a good time and you're exploring this cool kind of underwater setting and like there's no dialogue or anything it's just music and exploring and it's wonderful and like I, I was crying at like 2 a.m as i got halfway through the game because of one of the things that happened and i'm like I, how do i tell anybody about this because i'm just like this is just a sea creature that i was hanging out with and a thing happened and i'm like I, I, it, it's so cool to have an experience that is so full of wonder and emotion and like that's what i'm chasing when i'm playing games now i mean i also like to blow things up don't get me wrong i you know jump into a mecca and you know roll 20 dice and and go yeah i did a thousand points of damage but um but then i also want to get out of the mech and then confess my love for the other mecha pilot right like that's that's what you do um so we are almost out of time here um all right uh so let's actually just go around and plug our stuff again i think we're about ready to close out uh so i am richard kreutzlandry my twitter is r kreutzlandry uh which is hard to spell but you can probably find me if you go to at dimrpg which is the twitter account for uh descent in the midnight um that's pretty much my stuff i do origami and game design uh and i'm a software developer for kids math stuff but um Set in midnight is, is kind of my big thing at the moment. Uh, Taylor. Yeah, and actually, I'm going to steal something that we did on a previous panel, which was as we are Ooh. plugging stuff, if we want to put links in the chat, uh, that way Ooh, folks yes. who are watching the video on demand later can go grab those, and people in the chat now can get them. Um, so I'll let you pop those in, into the chat on Twitch. Um, but I will say that uh, I am Taylor. I am on Twitter at Leviathan Files. I use he and pronouns. Um, I am uh, one of the developers on Descent into Midnight, and I would love it if people played that. But also, um, if you want to check out uh, the game that I've been talking about, this is a game about fishing. It's currently in early access. Uh, I'm building uh, more and more of it out. Um, the, the link where you can get the early access is in the chat now. Um, if you get early access, you will automatically get every update that comes out, including the full release. Um, and uh, you can also find my podcast, Game Closet, an informal chat show with queer and LGBT plus folks in the tabletop RPG space uh, on iTunes or wherever podcasts are sold. I'm going to put a link in the chat for that, too. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, all right. So, Whitney, tell us about your stuff, what you do, and all that good stuff. Uh, hi, I'm Whitney. You can find me um, at Twitter at, at Whittle Dragon. Um, you can also find me at Little Wish Productions for, for information about my game, Prism which is an aquatic role-playing game about relationships and conflict resolution. You can also find my artwork there. Um, uh, I've done stretch goals in other games, and I am always happy to talk about weird, silly things, so things like, like non-toxic bro culture and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Brad. Uh, and then finally, Megan, take us home. Right. Um, so uh, I'm on Twitter at curium247, uh, C-U-R-I-U-M-247. You can find my Twitter on podcast at Amber Clave, uh, A-M-B-E-R-C-L-A-V-E, -E, um, or at TRF Podcast, which is where all the Redacted Files stuff is. Um, and you can find those on their websites at theredactedfiles.com and theamberclave.com. And then I'm also on another podcast uh, where we play Firefly, which is simply at Firefly Podcast. Um, hey, that's that's A plus branding. Like, I know. Yeah, that's good Remo. <laughs> um, you can find some uh. stuff I've written. None of it is super aquatic um, on Drive Through RPG. If you search for Megan Tolentino, one of them does take place on the Oregon coast, though. Uh, mm. If you want to. Uh, Call of Cthulhu horror adventure inspired by my tri uh, childhood trips to the Oregon coast. Which sounds amazing, right? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Oh, actually, that reminds me. Um, <clears throat> there is a Scientific Secrets of the Salt Marsh on, I believe, DMs Guild. Uh, that's a bunch of, uh, granted, it's for 5e, which right now, but um, 
Uh, it's cool aquatic monsters uh, from a bunch of like marine scientists and actual like scientific articles. We all went and did like, uh, you know, like, hey, here's what a whale fall is. And here's some rad art about it. And here's a cool monster design. And of course you can take that and port it into any system you want. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was a cool project that we did recently. Um, awesome. Uh, it, didn't see any other questions in the chat so uh i think we're all set so uh have a great sunday um and take care <laughs>